This is Rodney Atkinson. There has been a coup against the people of Britain and those nation states of Europe which were liberated from fascism in 1945 and from communism in 1989. It has been a coup against the sovereignty of the voters, the very definition of democracy. Those who sought to destroy democratic sovereignty knew they could not succeed if they were open about their intentions, and they could not succeed if they attempted their coup within one democratic system. They therefore acted behind the democratic system and across national borders. They established in the European Union a bureaucratic corporatist state so monolithic that most can be intimidated into silence by the very size of the project and emasculated by the necessary remoteness of the powers involved. The plans for this essentially fascist process were laid and carried out by, among others, many leading Nazis and fascists after the Second World War and realised in the European Union today. The fact that many naive constructors of today's Europe had good intentions does not mitigate the fact that they have summoned up the hated regimes of the fascist past and created structures built on the ashes of democratic nationhood, all of which coincides with the plans of the very European fascists they thought they were expunging. Now that their hitherto secret aim of turning the democratic nation-states of Europe into a gigantic corporatist empire is imminent, the new dictators have grown bold. Now they can act as if the voters do not exist, for they know the voters have no power. Although the European constitution was thrown out comprehensively by the people of France and the Netherlands, It has been reintroduced in the form of the so-called Lisbon Treaty, and EU governments have been intimidated into avoiding referenda of their peoples. Having blocked such referenda, the European Commission had the unmitigated gall to launch a new initiative under the heading Debate Europe, Giving Citizens a Voice. 95% of the member states of the European Union denied their peoples the right to vote on the massive loss of democratic rights in the Lisbon Treaty. No wonder that, according to Eurobarometer tests of public opinion, only 50% of the people of the European Union now support the European Union at all. Even more disgracefully, the Irish may have changed their minds on Lisbon because they were frightened by the collapse of their economy. How ironic, because that collapse was due to German financial exploitation of their banks and because Irish membership of the euro prevented them from controlling their own exchange rate and interest rates in a recession. The Lisbon Treaty establishes a new legal country to which EU member states are subservient. It makes future constitutional change possible even without consulting them. It removes the EU's founding principle of free and undistorted trade. It both bans and then reintroduces the death penalty for riots and upheavals, permits the restrictions of rights and freedoms to serve the interests of the European Union and allows EU armed forces to enter any country. The Irish, destroyed by the Euro, and under intolerable pressure, voted yes to all that. The European Union now knows that all they have to do to finish off the constitutions of EU member states is to finish off their economies first. The frightened voters will then kowtow. The European Union is based on the Nazi plans of 1941, published as they were in Berlin in 1942. The EU was founded by, among others, leading Nazis and fascists, as was the Charlemagne Prize awarded to Tony Blair, Edward Heath, Roy Jenkins and others for their role in removing democratic sovereignty from the nation-states of Europe. As in the 1940s, we witness today the breakup of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia and the recreation of the petty states of Slovakia, Croatia, Bosnia and Albanian Kosovo. These states were all Nazi allies during the 1940s and each provided Germany with a full Waffen-SS division. 
Europe's post-war leaders have repeated virtually word for word the beliefs of the leaders of fascism in the 1930s and 1940s. For a comprehensive demonstration of the parallels, see my books Fascist Europe Rising and Europe's Full Circle. The European Union has promoted and funded the ethnic cleansing of a million Europeans in the Balkans, mostly Serbs, Jews and Gypsies, from Croatia, Kosovo and Bosnia, realising the ambitions of fascist organisations in those countries. It is, of course, the European Union, embraced by Labour, Liberal Democrat and Conservative parties alike, which has resurrected Croatia, a country with the most blatant fascist traditions in Europe, whose football supporters today form swastikas on the terraces and whose leading pop star calls himself Thompson after a machine gun used against the Serbs and whose supporters give Nazi salutes. Croatia was of course guilty of the greatest ethnic cleansing in Europe for decades when they drove some 300,000 Serbs out of their historic homeland in the Kraina in 1995. The links between Croatian fascists and German Nazis in the modern day is well documented. I quote here from a book, Führer X, written by Ingo Hasselbach, a former German neo-Nazi who was intimately involved with German Nazis and Croatian fascists as Croatia fought to break up Yugoslavia throughout the 1990s. In this, they had the indirect support of the German army and the German government who, of course, were President Tudjman's principal backers and the first to recognise the illegally created state of Croatia in 1991. Hasselbach writes, The then government in Croatia, under President Franjo Tudjman, was reviving the tradition of the Ustashi and in many other ways honouring the former fascists. Units of the Croatian army were flying swastika flags and many more were flying the old Croatian fascist symbol. Croatia had become the first European government since World War II to openly embrace these symbols. All of the West German neo-Nazis saw it as a powerful opportunity, but Nero Reitz, the barking anti-Semite from Hesse, was particularly pleased. The problem for him was that there weren't enough Jews being killed but Serbs would do. There are, today, 27 former nation-states of Europe who have no constitution, no elected governance, and citizens who can be arrested and passed from country to country without prima facie evidence of any crime or recourse to the traditional protections of jury trial or habeas corpus. How has this happened, and who is responsible? You only really know a political institution by the kind of people who support it. By that measure alone, the fascist origins of the European Union are difficult to deny. I set out here the names of the prominent Nazis and fascists of the 1930s and 1940s, who then became prominent political leaders of European countries and of the European Union itself, where they helped to construct the European state which rules us today. Walter Hallstein. Hallstein was State Secretary for Foreign Affairs under Adenauer. He established the Hallstein Doctrine, which denied diplomatic recognition to those states which recognized East Germany. He had been a member of many leading Nazi organizations, the most significant of which were the National Socialist University Lecturers Association, Dozentenbund, where he qualified as a Nazi leadership officer enabling him to join the army as an officer in 1942. And he was also a member of the National Socialist League for Protection of the Law, Rechtswahrerbund. Such organizations were not like being a mere member of the Nazi party. They were central cadres of Nazi rule to which only the most committed would have been admitted. The French President General de Gaulle summed up Hallstein in the following words, If Dr. Hallstein is a convinced European, it is because he is first and foremost an ambitious German. His ambition during the Nazi period was evident from his intimate involvement in the preservation of Nazi doctrine in universities and the promotion of Nazism in German law. 
Walter Hallstein became the first president of the EEC Commission in 1958. Paul Henry Spark Spark joined the Belgian national government as foreign minister in 1936 and with Henri de Man developed the Belgian National Socialist Party. One of his notable acts was to refuse assistance to the legal Spanish Republican government then locked in civil war with Franco's fascists. In 1938, Spark said, Some people wish to lead us into a policy of solidarity with the democracies against the fascist states. I refuse to stick to such a policy. He concluded, If Great Britain and France want to help Czechoslovakia by invading Germany through Belgium, they will be treated as invaders. In fact, as the memoirs of Sir Alexander Cadogan, the pre-war British cabinet minister, note, that is exactly how the British forces seeking to defend Belgium against the invading Nazis were treated. Paul Henry Spark became one of the EU's founding fathers and Secretary General of NATO. Walter Funk Funk joined the Nazi party in 1931 and promptly became not only Hitler's personal economic advisor, he was also Reich press chief and minister under Goebbels at the Propaganda Ministry. And finally, he became the Reich's economics minister in 1938. He was the principal liaison man between the Nazi party and the large industrialists from whom he obtained financial and political support on Hitler's behalf. On the 3rd of December 1938, Funk again advanced the policy of economic extermination by signing a decree which provided that owners of Jewish enterprises could be ordered to sell or liquidate their enterprises. Jews could be ordered to sell and were prohibited from acquiring any real estate. Jews were forced to deposit all stocks, mining shares, bonds and other securities with specially designated banks and accounts had to be marked Jewish. Funk was convicted at the Nuremberg trials and on his release in 1957 he was employed by the Lower Saxony Education Ministry where he helped to propagate the new European economic community to German schools and universities. Although Funk died in 1960, his blueprint for the European Economic Community, drawn up in Berlin in 1941, is virtually indistinguishable from the structure of today's European Union. Hans-Josef Globke By now you'll have gathered that most of the Nazi functionaries continued in public life, either as officials or as politicians. Dr. Adenauer, Germany's post-war chancellor, appointed a man called Globke as his state secretary, that is, director of the chancellor's office in Bonn. Globke was the man who had drafted the Nuremberg race laws. It was on Globke's advice that Adenauer made his senior appointments. Globke helped to formulate the emergency legislation that gave Hitler unlimited dictatorial powers in 1933. He had also written a law commentary on the new Reich citizenship law, the Nuremberg race laws which revoked the citizenship of German Jews. After the war, Globke became director of the Federal Chancellery of West Germany between 1953 and 1963 and as such was one of the closest aides to Federal Chancellor Konrad Adenauer during the plans for and the foundation of the European Union. Globke's key position as a national security advisor to Adenauer and his involvement in anti-communist activities in post-war West Germany made both the West German government and CIA officials wary of exposing his Nazi past. This led, for instance, to the withholding of Adolf Eichmann's alias from the Israeli government and Nazi hunters in the late 1950s, and CIA pressure in 1960 on Life magazine to delete references to Globke from its recently obtained Eichmann memoirs. Alcide de Gasperi The then journalist, de Gasperi, belonged to that Catholic world of the early days of the Mussolini regime in Italy, with which the Vatican collaborated and maintained close contacts. On the day Mussolini came to power, truckloads of nuns paraded through the streets of Rome, giving the fascist salute, which indicates 
the attitude of the Vatican in which de Gasperi worked in the 1930s. He was librarian in the Vatican as it became the first state to recognize the Nazi regime and sign its notorious 1934 Concordat with Hitler's Germany. Even during the Nazi occupation, de Gasperi was involved in intrigues against parts of the resistance in order to break up left-wing Catholicism and communist partisans. In 1943, as the war turned against the fascist powers, de Gasperi tried to reinvent himself by founding the Italian Christian Democrat Party. After becoming Italian president in December 1945, de Gasperi pleaded for an end to the criminal prosecution of Mussolini's fascist supporters. In 1952, he was awarded the Nazi-founded Charlemagne Prize, the principal prize for those constructing the European Union. Lady Diana Mosley. Like several aristocratic families and like so many politicians of all parties during the 1930s, Lady Mosley was charmed by fascism. Like Lloyd George, she admired Hitler. Like the liberal Lord Lothian or the socialist Arnold Toynbee, she would certainly have joined a Nazi-based government of Britain. Like Labour's Lord Allen of Hertwood, she would have argued for more African colonies for the German Reich. And like the conservative Sir Samuel Hoare, she would have tried to get rid of Churchill in order to prevent war. Her husband, Sir Oswald Mosley, founded a fascist newspaper called The European. And Lady Diana Mosley, in an interview with the BBC shortly before her death, poured scorn on British Eurosceptics and gave total support to the European Union. Strange that the BBC should so recently interview a lifelong fascist. But perhaps not, when we consider that the BBC kept Churchill off the air for 28 months between 1937 and 1939. Alfred Töpfer, the founder of the Alfred Töpfer Foundation. Töpfer's business interests in the 1940s provided slaked lime for the mass graves in the lodge ghetto and was involved in the industrial exploitation of occupied France. In the final days of the war, Heinrich Himmler and other leading Nazis gathered at Töpfer's estate, Kalkost, a Nazi Reich leadership school. Foreign collaborators with the Nazis were trained to take over governorships of the German Reich in the conquered European states. The founder himself, Töpfer, gave race lectures at Kalkost. After the war, Töpfer supported financially Thies Christofferson, the author of the book The Auschwitz Lie, which denied the extermination of the Jews. The Töpfer Foundation has, since the war, demanded further compensation for their lost Nazi land in the East. The former Nazi possessions comprise several hundred hectares and are the subject of dispositions made by the 1945 Potsdam Agreement. The Töpfer Foundation today has claimed the protection of the European Human Rights Convention. The foundation is today a highly influential political movement. The notorious foundation belongs to an influential group of German ethno-organizations and enjoys direct contact with the German government. A former Minister of State in the German Chancellery, Christina Weiss, Social Democrat, worked under the auspices of the Töpfer Foundation. Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands Originally the German Prince zur Lippe Biesterfeld Prince Bernhard, who was the co-founder of the Bilderberg Group and one of the original promoters of the European Union, had also been an SS intelligence officer before the war. He had been attached to the Nazi conglomerate IG Farben, which promoted Nazi interests around the world and spied for the German state. IG Farben was so dangerous that it was broken up by the Allies after the war, although many of its successor parts, like BASF, are particularly active in promoting the European Union today. This information about Bernhardt and the company he worked for was confirmed by evidence of Max Ilgner, the former head of IG Farben, at his trial at Nuremberg. Despite continuous denials after the war that he had ever been a Nazi Party member, Bernhardt was revealed in 1995, thanks to details released from US archives and published in the Netherlands, to have been a member of the Nazi Party from an early date, along with no fewer than 11 members of his family. 
A copy of his resignation letter is in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. The letter ended, Heil Hitler, hardly a renunciation of Nazism. According to many, including the British academic Dr. Richard Aldrich, Prince Bernhardt's Bilderberg Group was far more important than the European movement in creating the European Union. George McGee, later ambassador to Germany, and who in fact had been my father's tutor at Oxford in the 1930s, confirmed that the Treaty of Rome which brought the European community into being was nurtured at Bilderberg meetings. There was an interesting British press cover-up in 2002 when the Daily Telegraph printed an obituary of Prince Klaus of the Netherlands on the 8th of October. Mention was made of his father-in-law, Prince Bernhard, having steered clear of the Nazis in the 1930s. I wrote to the obituary letter pointing out Prince Bernhard's long-standing members of the Nazi party, his role as an SS intelligence officer attached to IG Farben, etc., etc., The editor referred me to the letter's editor, but she refused to publish the letter. After detailed correspondence with Charles Moore of the Daily Telegraph, the paper still refused to publish the facts, i.e. to correct their complete falsehood about Prince Bernhard. The Times, the Daily Mail and the Evening Standard refused to cover the story. Kurt Georg Kiesinger Kiesinger was an early member of the Nazi party and as early as 1934 became a member of the Sturmabteilung. In April 1940, he joined the German Foreign Office and became the head of the department responsible for the Nazis' radio propaganda, not a function left to anyone other than a convinced Nazi. He was responsible for propaganda in the occupied territories, promoting the German military and political forces in France, Belgium and Greece, where he broadcast via the Nazi Radio Patrice, encouraging chaos, murder and sabotage by the population against the Greek state. Despite his consistent representation of the Nazi totalitarian state, after the war, in 1945, and with the support of two Nazi colleagues in the German Foreign Office, he was able to take up his career again. The German Foreign Office was notorious under Adenauer as having hundreds of former Nazis long after the war. In 1966, Kurt Georg Kiesinger, as leader of the German Christian Democrat Party, became Chancellor of Germany. Theodor Heuss. Heuss was a former designer of concentration camps and supplier of slave labor to the V2 project as Tom Bower in his book Blind Eye to Murder testifies. Heuss voted for Hitler's infamous Enabling Act in 1933, which gave the Nazis the power to override both houses of parliament, the source of Hitler's absolute power. Heuss became federal president of Germany in 1949 and was therefore intimately involved in the creation of the European Union. The Federal Union of European Ethnic Groups The FUEV is an anti-Semitic, Nazi-supported, German-dominated promoter of ethnic regional politics. And that very regional principle now being embraced in Britain by the Labour government. Both the Welsh nationalists and the Cornish separatists are associated with the FUEV. One ethnic group is excluded. As an early statement of the FUEV's principles established... Jews are excluded from ethnic rights enjoyed by other nations. Today that organisation is active throughout Europe and in particular among German minorities in Germany's neighbouring countries, the Czech Republic, Belgium, Denmark, Poland, etc. The FUEV pursues the goal of a federal Europe of the regions, which means in their own words the end of the unitary and centralised nation-states, but not, of course, the end of the centralised European superstate. Since the 1950s, when Hans-Josef Graf Matuschka of the European Union of Germany, as it then was, succeeded in linking the FUEV to the German Foreign Office, the organisation has had the financial support of the German government. It is involved in the European Union's Committee of the Regions and the European Council's 
Congress of Communities and Regions, and since 1995, it is represented in the UN itself. It is no mitigation of the above to say that most of those individuals are long gone, for the institutions they helped to found are not only active today, but the constitutional structures they created now govern most of Europe. They do so indeed by virtue of European treaties which refer consistently in truly fascist style to their irrevocable and irreversible provisions. The Charlemagne Prize The prize was originally founded by the Nazis, but was then re-founded in 1949 by the efforts of the Aachen textile merchant Kurt Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer, who had previously been a member of the Nazi party and of five other Nazi organizations, maintained that he had always tended to be a fundamental believer in Europe, and the Charlemagne Prize Society was to be associated with the imperial idea, Reichsidee, of the Emperor Charlemagne. The post-war image of Charlemagne as unifier of the Christian West was preceded by his Nazi portrayal as unifier of the German tribes. Charlemagne had been compared with Hitler, his Reich and Greater Germany. This is clearly exemplified by the career of the Aachen Professor of Philosophy Peter Menneken, who took over the professorship previously occupied by an expelled Jew, and who after the war had authorised influence over the symbolism of the Charlemagne Prize and the liturgy of its award ceremonies. Menneken had joined the SA, the Stormtroopers, in 1933 and the Nazi Party in 1937. He used his lectureship at the Technical High School of Aachen in the service of expansionist Western research and worked for two so-called Societies for International Understanding, which were informal offshoots of the Nazi propaganda ministry, used for German propaganda in the Netherlands and Belgium. It is therefore not surprising, considering those who were involved in the foundation of the European Union, that its top prize, the Charlemagne Prize, should have had such well-authenticated Nazi roots. But now let us consider some post-war European, British and American figures who were influential in establishing the now powerful European Union, and its rule over 27 nation-states of Europe. George Kennan Kennan, who died in 2005, was possibly the leading post-war US foreign affairs expert and an authority on Russia. Left-wing, supranationalist with excessive sympathy for authoritarian regimes in Germany, Spain and Italy, and a critical influence on US foreign policy in the 1950s, Kennan was a regular attendee at the Bilderberg Group, which nurtured the creation of the European Union. Kennan found Nazi Germany so palatable that he studied in Heidelberg in the 1930s and stayed even until the early 1940s when he was interned at Bad Nauheim. There he even lectured, obviously with the approval of the Nazis, the German magazine Der Spiegel reported on the 5th of December 1951 that Lecturing there, he had claimed that Germany's defeat would extinguish the 2,000-year-old history of European civilization. He attacked the Allies for not enforcing a greater circumspection on the Nazi regime and caused it to proceed more slowly with the actualization of its timetable. After the war, Kennan was particularly influential in stopping the denazification program initiated in 1945. A recent biographer chronicles Kennan's baffling appreciation of Europe's dictatorships, Mussolini's in Italy, Dolphus' in Austria, Salazar's in Portugal. Kennan believed that their kind of authoritarian government was a healthy and welcome alternative to inefficient parliamentary democracy. At Kennan's suggestion in the 1950s, the US changed its long-standing hostility to Franco's fascist regime in Spain in order to secure U.S. influence in the Mediterranean. Cannon thought the First World War had not been worth fighting, and he said in an interview with the New York Review of Books in 1999, I would like to see our government gradually withdraw from its public advocacy of democracy and human rights. Giuliani Amato 
was a former Prime Minister of Italy and became Vice Chairman of the European Union's Constitutional Convention, which drew up the European Constitution, which of course was thoroughly rejected by the French and the Dutch in referenda, but has been reintroduced in the so-called Lisbon Treaty. In the Italian newspaper La Stampa of 13th of July 2000, Amato wrote, Sovereignty lost on a national level does not pass to any new individual. It is entrusted to a faceless entity, and those in command can neither be identified nor elected. As a matter of fact, the metamorphosis is already here. All we need are a few corrections here and there, along with a great deal of cunning. Their place will be taken by a multitude of authorities, each of which will be at the head of different interests. This, of course, is a classic element of fascism. And he continues, Different interests that possess ambiguous levels of power. By moving, the power we are used to will disappear. In other words, the democratic power we are used to will disappear. Indeed, as we all know, it has disappeared. Amato continued in his La Stampa article, In Europe one needs to act as if, as if what was wanted was little in order to obtain much, as if states were to remain sovereign to convince them to concede sovereignty. The Commission in Brussels, for example, should act as if it were a technical instrument in order to be able to be treated as a government, and so on by disguise and subterfuge. What a very good summary that is of the fascist process behind the substance of the European Union. Now let's look at Kenneth Clark, the former Conservative Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer. It was Kenneth Clark, who was a young student in the Cambridge University Conservative Association, who invited Oswald Mosley, the leader of the British Union of Fascists, to speak, and the young Michael Howard, who became leader of the Conservative Party, resigned from the association in protest. Many political and corporate beliefs unite a Eurofanatic anti-democrat like Kenneth Clark and the former leader of the British Union of Fascists, Oswald Mosley. So perhaps the invitation was not surprising. Mosley had said, At a moment of supreme crisis, the will to Europe a nation can arise everywhere from the soil of Europe like a primeval fire. First must come the idea. There is little difference between that which Oswald Mosley as an individual and the 1962 fascist National Party of Europe set out, and that in which Kenneth Clark, the so-called conservative of today, believes, and which European treaties since 1957 have achieved. That explains why Clark voted recently to prevent the British people having a vote on the Lisbon Constitutional Treaty although I note that he was chairman of the Conservative Party's Democracy Task Force. To say that the European Union is a combination of modern corporatism and historic fascism may sound extraordinary, but I have laid out substantial evidence for this in my two books, Europe's Full Circle and Fascist Europe Rising, and I will provide more evidence in my forthcoming book, Into the Fire. So finally you might like to guess which of these quotations from European leaders stem from the fascist 1930s and 40s, and which from the heyday of the European Union's construction in the 1980s and 90s. Might is right in politics and war. Genocide is a natural phenomenon. It is recommended, even commanded, by the Almighty. Many Jews survived today thanks to the circumstance that they were forced labourers Germans are tired of philo-Semitic overcompensation in the media and sterile grief rituals by politicians. The Jews should consider whether they would have behaved heroically if they had not been victims of the persecution. Germany should now, as it has become peaceful and reasonable, get all that Europe and the whole world has refused in two gigantic wars, a sort of smooth hegemony over Europe. 
Well, in fact, all the above quotes are from European leaders of the 1980s and 1990s. They were in the following order. Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of Germany, Franjo Tudjman, President of Croatia, Lutz Niethammer, advisor to German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, Klaus von Donani, the former mayor of Hamburg, and finally Joske Fischer, the former German Foreign Secretary. No wonder, as Newsweek noted on the 6th of June 1997, the German troops who marched into Bosnia after the breakup of Yugoslavia were greeted with cries of Sieg Heil. And no wonder the Kosovo Albanians said as NATO troops marched in that they were pleased to see the fascist armies. And they meant it in complimentary fashion. We live in very dangerous times. But let us be in no doubt what has happened to the United Kingdom as it surrendered to the rule of those who have for centuries sought our destruction. Nothing has happened which our Parliament and our governments did not freely do to themselves, albeit behind the backs of the true sovereigns, the voters. And if our MPs and government wish to survive, there is no power on earth which can stop them restoring the sovereignty of a free British people. But so long as they refuse to do so, they are and will be seen to be guilty of the enslavement of Britain by those very imperialist and fascist European powers which 50 million deaths and two world wars apparently failed to defeat.